Right. While everyone else continues to be admitted into the Zoom, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're very excited for this, our first in the series of DMFI at the DNC virtual events that we're having this week. Uh, my name is Elliot Mendes for Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our entire staff, uh, our President and CEO, Mark Melman, our Board of Directors and our Board Co-Chairs, Ann Lewis uh, and Todd Richmond, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope you and your family are staying safe and healthy during this time. Uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, highlight a couple other programs coming up this week after this one today. Uh, tomorrow, we have uh, the next generation of pro-Israel Democratic leaders uh, featuring some uh, recently added and will be added members of Congress. Uh, and on Wednesday, we're going to look ahead to the November elections with insiders to understand the polls and the trends and what people are going to be paying attention to and what you can look for. Uh, if you like what you hear today, and this week, please uh, join us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can sign up for our news and updates on our website, dmfi.org. All of our events this week are being live captioned as well. Uh, to enable that, you can click on the, on the CC button towards the bottom of your Zoom screen. And finally, uh, after a little bit of conversation today, we will be taking questions from uh, all of the participants. Uh, if you're on joining us via Zoom, there is a Q&A feature towards the bottom where you can uh, submit a question. Uh, if you're on Facebook, please type that question into the comments box and we'll be looking for those. With that said, uh, it's my pleasure now to turn over to DMFI's President and CEO, Mark Melman. Thank you so much, Elliot. Thank you all for joining us. I will say just starting to feel a little like a Democratic National Convention. Um, up until now, I would say it has not felt that way, but just a second ago, I sort of got that twinge. Um, but I would welcome everybody uh, uh, to the uh, session this afternoon. Um, I'll introduce our panelists in a minute, but let me start by just, uh, for those that are not familiar with DMFI, uh, giving you a word or two about what we are up to. Uh, Democratic Majority for Israel was founded to ensure that the Democratic Party remains pro-Israel and that that pro-Israel Democratic Party succeeds in winning elections uh, around the country. Uh, it's our view and it's our experience uh, that when the Democratic Party has that pro-Israel positioning, uh, it's good policy and it's good politics. Uh, Democrats win elections under those circumstances. Uh, if we lose that, if we lose those, uh, that pro-Israel bona fides, <clears throat> as we saw with the Labor Party in Britain, uh, one can be in deep, deep trouble. Uh, DMFI is very proud of what we've accomplished in a short time. We've been around for about a year and a half. Uh, and frankly, without us, uh, we think many of these outcomes would not have happened. Uh, we uh, helped organize uh, with respect to the Democratic platform nationally, but we also helped organize uh, to defeat anti-Israel planks in states across the country, from California uh, to Nevada to Texas, other places all across the country. Uh, we deployed uh, organizers and staff to Iowa, New Hampshire, so that to organize over 3,000 local pro-Israel Democrats in those early states to make sure that every diner those presidential candidates walked into, every town hall they attended, somebody raised their hand and said, I'm an Iowa pro-Israel Democrat. I want a pro-Israel nominee and a pro-Israel platform, and here's my pro-Israel question. So we've been engaged in a whole variety of activities, communications with the Hill, uh, other kinds of activities as well, uh, and they've made a difference. We have a sister organization, the MFI PAC that is directly uh, engaged in electoral activity. Uh, we've been involved in 19 races. Uh, we've won 18 of those 19. Uh, we did lose one and we're very sorry about it. It was a big and important race, but overall we've won 18 of those 19 races and we're really uh, delighted by that. Uh, we're especially thrilled today to be joined by such an outstanding panel. Uh, there's a saying in, in Washington that where you sit depends on where you stand. Uh, sorry, where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, and uh, each of our panelists here have uh, been sat on Capitol Hill. They've sat in executive departments, either the, uh, uh, the Defense Department or the State Department or both. Uh, and uh, also uh, in, uh, in uh, Ambassador Shapiro's case, uh, in the White House and uh, as an ambassador. So we're gonna get perspectives from all ends of Pennsylvania Avenue and, and even some buildings that aren't in Pen on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, but uh, Ambassador Dan Shapiro, uh, served as the U.S. Ambassador to Israel under President Obama starting in 2011. Uh, he participated in negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. He participated in negotiations uh, that led to the historic uh, memorandum of understanding between the United States and Israel guaranteeing U.S. Uh, military aid to Israel over the next 10 years. Uh, and he participated in discussions around the uh, uh, Iran agreement. He is currently uh, a distinguished fellow, visiting fellow, 
at the Institute for National Security Studies uh, in Israel. Uh, Mira Resnick uh, is the uh, senior professional staff member for the Democratic staff at the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, she is the person in the House of Representatives, the staff person on Israel in the US House of Representatives. Uh, and she has worked previously at the State Department um, and uh, in various capacities uh, and is uh, obviously an expert on our issues as well. Uh, Dana Stroll is the uh, Shelley and Michael Casson Fellow in the Washington Institute's Beth and David Gedold uh, Program on Arab Politics. <laughs> uh, I got that out. Uh, she previously served uh, in a similar capacity uh, to Mira, but for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as a, a senior member of the professional staff there covering the Middle East. Uh, before going to the Hill, uh, she worked in, on Middle East policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So again, we have a variety of perspectives, uh, a variety of experiences uh, among people who are extremely uh, helpful to us, and we're delighted uh, that Dan and Mira and Dana were able to join us and willing to join us this morning uh, at a very critical time in the U.S.-Israel relations at a very critical time in the Middle East, and I know it will be illuminating, an illuminating discussion. Let me turn back to Elliot to get us started. Mark, thank you very much, and again, thank you all for being here, and thanks to everyone who has started submitting questions. Uh, let's start, which I think is what's on the top of everyone's mind. Had we had this meeting a week ago, we would have been in a very different place, um, but uh, Ambassador Shaviro, we've had a few days now, and you're on the ground. How is uh, the announcement between the UAE and Israel settling in? Uh, what are you seeing, uh, hearing, or any impacts that you can take away at this point? Sure. Uh, thanks for uh, hosting uh, this event. Thank you to uh, Mark and all the board members of DMFI. Thanks for, for joining. It's great to be with uh, Mira and Dana, good friends and colleagues. Um, the announcement of the normalization agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates has been uh, obviously very well received uh, by most Israelis. It's a, a, lot, a cause of a lot of excitement. Many Israelis are already planning a family vacation to Dubai or planning to fly through Dubai to some other location. Uh, it's going to take a little while to get some of those arrangements put in place, but it seems to have momentum. A number of Israeli reporters are on the ground uh, in the UAE reporting from there, and people are following it, it closely. Uh, and I think this is all uh, appropriate. This has been a, a long-term bipartisan goal for the United States uh, to pursue normalization between Israel and Arab states, obviously something Israel has also uh, sought to do and had only achieved it in twice previously with Egypt and Jordan. Uh, so it's good news. It breaks an important barrier. Uh, everyone should welcome it. Uh, and there's a lot of excitement and hope that uh, additional uh, Arab states will be following uh, this announcement, Bahrain and Oman, are the two that are mentioned uh, most frequently. Uh, but uh, there are certainly other candidates, including uh, Sudan, including Morocco. Uh, the, the, the big uh, uh, the question mark hangs over Saudi Arabia, which is obviously extre extremely influential. I don't think things are going to move quite that quickly. But uh, there is a sense that this is the first of a series uh, of uh, normalization possibilities. And so that's very good news. Uh, there's additional good news in the announcement, uh, which is that it really marks the end of discussion of uh, unilateral annexation by Israel in the West Bank. Uh, that uh, was uh, clearly the choice presented by the UAE uh, when their ambassador to Washington, Yusuf al Taiba, wrote an op-ed in Hebrew in an Israeli newspaper in June, uh, very respectfully speaking to the Israeli people, saying, we know there's a lot of excitement about the idea of normalizing relations. We are open to it to see many possibilities for cooperation in many fields, but Israelis should understand that it's not compatible with annexation. So you have to make a choice. It's one or the other. It can't be both. Uh, well, the Israeli government made that choice. Uh, now, it is true that uh, the prime minister has been saying to uh, some of the critics uh, of that decision among uh, his uh, right wing base and his party, among some settler advocates who had hoped annexation would proceed, that this is a suspension, that he would do it at some later time while uh, in coordination with the United States. But this was a very clear uh, trade-off uh, made with the UAE. Uh, it would be very humiliating to the UAE's leader, Mohammed bin Zayed, to then go back and try to annex later. It's clearly not something the Trump administration uh, is interested in, uh, for now anyway. And uh, I think we all know that uh, the Biden administration, which I, I'm very confident uh, where you see, and we're gonna all work hard to bring about, uh, uh, is also one that uh, where in which annexation will not be on the table. Annexation really would be uh, uh, probably the end of any serious prospects of a two-state solution that would end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict should never really have been floated 
in the context of, of the Trump plan. So now it's off the table. And in fact, I think I'll just close with this thought. Uh, once that is off the table, it actually opens up possibilities to, to shelve other parts of the Trump peace plan, which are really not consistent with a credible two-state outcome and return to a more traditional American leadership role in trying to uh, bring about a two-state solution that, of course, meets Israel's security needs and sustains its Jewish and democratic character, also fulfills Palestinian rights for dignity and self-determination in a state of their own, but this time to have an expanded circle of Arab uh, countries already having normalized ties with Israel who can actually be mobilized in the service of achieving that goal. Uh, providing additional uh, opportunities for Arab-Israeli interaction, but also support and some kinds of positive pressure on the Palestinians to get in the game uh, and be participants to this effort. So I'm actually hopeful that this can open up some additional opportunities uh, in the next phase. And Dana, let's just build on something that the ambassador just said. Uh, the next Arab states uh, who might be going down this road of normalizing relations with Israel, um, what else are we looking for? What are some of the other issues at play uh, that we should be cognizant of or the conversations that will be happening as they jockey to see who might get in line next or where that will go? So that's a great question. And I want to thank DMFI, the board of directors, Mark, you, Elliot, uh, for holding this event today. Um, I associate myself with everything Ambassador Shapiro said. And, and to build on that, when the UAE normalized or announced this normalization of relations with Israel, what it's doing is formalizing a lot of interaction and relationships that were already taking place. A lot of people talk about on the under the table relationship that Israel has been developing with many Gulf states. Um, and some of that started on a foundation of shared security and intelligence concerns. So at the time, one of the greatest areas of strategic convergence, and this started during the Obama administration, uh, was shared threat of Iran. And this motivated Israel and Gulf states to uh, enhance security cooperation, intelligence collaboration, et cetera. And it also helped open up opportunities for the United States to facilitate engaged interactions and um, between Israel and its Gulf security partners. And after that, I think many Gulf uh, countries looking at the future of global economic opportunity, recognizing that the era of oil dependence on many, uh, that many countries have um, is not indefinite, recognizing the need to economically diversify, and also recognizing the immense commercial trade, agriculture, irrigation, scientific opportunities that are already coming about in Israel, and that there were tremendous opportunities um, for commercial interaction, trade interaction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a lot of that was already happening and this announcement really formalizes that and hopefully what we'll see is further steps. And it's also not unique to the Arab Emirates. So we know that there are um, already some very positive economic interactions between Oman and Israel, between Bahrain and Israel, there's a lot of reports of, of interest in, in both the Saudi private sector and the Saudi government by increased interactions with Israel. We know that the Qataris already interact very extensively with Israel. There's a history of trade representative offices, represented, represented offices. And also we know that there were some very big milestones coming up this year, such as the World Expo 2020 in Dubai. Now it'll be 2021. Israel was gonna have a booth at that World Expo. Qatar is hosting the World Cup in 2022. An Israeli team is, is supposed to be there in 2022, as well as potentially Israeli fans. So a lot of this regional tide was already moving. Um, and you can see that these relationships were already developed given how fast some agreements have already been signed since the normalization announcement. So over the weekend, the UAE and Israel signed um, an agreement on medical collaboration for rapid COVID-19 testing. So you can see where these shared convergences are. So going forward, as Ambassador Shapiro mentioned, there's interest from Oman, there's speculation that Oman or Bahrain might be next. I think both these governments and the people are gonna be looking at how fast the two governments and the two people can deliver on the promises of what this is. And also the United States played a big role. So for the UAE, there seems to be um, interest in moving forward with certain weapon sales from the United States that previously the US would have been hesitant to sell to the UAE because of a commitment to ensuring Israel's military edge. So if there's this burdening, um, burgeoning trust between Israel and its Gulf neighbors, 
then perhaps some of these Gulf countries can have access to more sophisticated weapon systems and this would be another motivator to move forward. So I think what everyone in the region is gonna be looking at as the UAE and Israel move forward is um, what are the mutual benefits commercially, um, agriculturally, scientifically, medically, and of course, what else does it get you here in the United States in terms of support, weapon sales, access, bipartisan praise, et cetera. Thank you, Dana. Mira, how is, uh, how is this deal being uh, interpreted on the Hill, especially uh, on the Democratic side where annexation had taken up so much oxygen uh, over the last little bit, and now uh, it's been suspended, it's off the table. Um, how is that gonna impact uh, the Democrat, Democrats' relationship with the U.S. Israel relationship throughout the rest of this year and into next? Thanks for the question, um, and thanks Elliot and Mark for holding this uh, this panel today. It's a great way to kick off the convention and a great way to celebrate democratic support for strengthening the U.S.-Israel relationship. Um, having annexation um, get, give a little bit of breathing room um, is, uh, is, is probably, I think, the way that most Democrats are seeing this. There's a bit of distrust of, of the process um, because this is coming from the Trump White House, but also because um, People are, Democrats are, are, are not willing necessarily to give Netanyahu the benefit of the doubt, Prime Minister Netanyahu, when, um, when he has already come out saying that he doesn't necessarily, that he's not, that he's not suspend, that he's not, um, that he's not taking it off the table for good. Um, but this absolutely gives Netanyahu a way out um, to not go forward with annexation. Um, this gives him a reason not to do it. And I think that that is something that is, um, that is, uh, really something to celebrate here. Um, that, that, uh, that this has always been a quiet relationship in the past, and I think that um, members of Congress um, who have traveled to the UAE, who have traveled to Israel, ha understand, um, you know, we were on a, we were on a CODA once um, where, um, where we uh, ran into a very high-ranking Israeli um, ambassador on his way to Dubai. Um, so this is this has always been something that's in the background, um, but um, but it was a cold piece. Uh, it, but but the rest of the pieces have been a very cold piece, and I think that the expectations for the UAE um, because they've had a um, a cold non-peace in the past, um, and because the UAE has been very forthcoming with um, with information about these kind of things, um, it would be great if um, if they can start to convince their people. Unlike some of the cold pieces that Israel has um, in the region, it would be great if they could uh, if they could really show that a relationship with Israel is in the country's interests, is in their economic interests, in their commercial interests, um, really demonstrate the value of, of, this, of this peace deal. And um, as Dan said, then to be able to put pressure on Palestinians. And I think that's where Democrats on the Hill would like to see this go, um, but because um, they don't see a, um, uh, an end to this conflict without a two-state solution. And, um, and that a two-state solution is um, is the is is a, is a is a goal that is on the horizon, um, and that we would like to see the Palestinians get back to the negotiating table. And let's uh, pivot subjects and, and go back to Dana for a second. Uh, the vice president uh, has been very clear uh, about uh, wanting to work with our allies again, um, re-engage in the JCPOA, but also strengthen and extend it uh, to address uh, facts on the ground, Iranian bad behavior. Um, Danny, you've been on the Hill. Uh, how might uh, both the UAE agreement uh, as well as uh, a Democratic-led White House be able to work with Capitol Hill, work with our allies, uh, which we were unable to uh, get a, an arms embargo at the Security Council done last week? Uh, how might that come together? And how do you think a Biden administration would think about approaching these issues? That's a great question. And I should make clear up front that I don't speak for the Biden campaign, but I can um, represent based on uh, what I read and what I hear and my experience working for the Democratic Party on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, the directions in which it, it seems they would go. So first of all, just broadly speaking on Iran policy, we do better on Iran policy, whatever our objectives are. When Iran is isolated and the United States has allies and partners working in its court in a strong network of alliances and partnerships. The main challenge to accomplishing any U.S. objectives in the Middle East, really, and specifically when it comes to Iran, is that all the other members of the negotiating group for the Iran nuclear agreement, the P5 plus one, and on almost any other issue related to Israel, the Middle East, or really any issue globally, is that the United States finds it extremely isolated. 
and you all have heard, you know, America first is America alone. And, and nowhere is that more clear than I think when it comes to Iran policy, the objectives of maximum pressure and what we saw happen at the UN Security Council last week when um, Russia and China vetoed the US uh, proposal for extending the UN arms embargo, every other member of the Security Council abstained except for the Dominican Republic. It really, to me, is um, com underscores how isolated the United States is. So the Biden campaign has been very clear that they believe the nuclear agreement when Iran was in compliance with it was the most effective means um, to constrain Iran's nuclear um, ambitions, allow the IAE consistent and rigorous access, and at the same time, give the United States and its partners and allies some breathing room to focus on the other problematic areas of Iranian activity, whether it's support for terrorism, proxies and militias across the Middle East, its ballistic missile program, its human rights abuses at home, its increasingly dangerous cyber activity, not only the United States, um, but also very much Israel. Um, all of these issues, we are not able to focus by rallying our partners and allies because there is so much attention um, on the isolation of the United States, number one. So I think when it comes to Iran and its problematic behavior, the first thing that a Biden administration would want to do is shore up our alliances and partnerships and get a general baseline of shared commitment to constraining Iran's nuclear ambitions. The other interesting um, byproduct of the uh, U Israel UAE announcement that I think we should really be thinking about now is one of the main criticisms coming from the region of the Iran nuclear agreement at the time is that the governments and people in the region were not at the table during those negotiations. And the UAE Israel normalization announcement is, as Ambassador Shapiro and, and Mira said, something that can be celebrated and is clearly a marker for bipartisan support. And we can build on some of this by having a much more um, concerted involvement of the governments in the region when eventually we're going to have to turn back to the Iran nuclear program. And now Iran is closer to developing a nuclear breakout capability than it ever was during the Iran nuclear negotiations. And if you look at the Trump administration, its articulation of what the maximum pressure campaign is, constraining Iran's regional activities, rolling back its nuclear program, compelling the regime to come to the table to negotiate um, a vastly different nuclear agreement, the, the Trump administration has accomplished none of those things. And I would also add that is um, about diplomacy. The Trump administration has decimated the State Department. So again, I think the Biden administration, um, a prospective Biden administration, in talking about um, less of a focus on the U.S. military as the um, front or the forefront of our uh, presence and engagement in the region, would re-energize diplomacy, which means being in the region, on the ground, empowering our ambassadors, and being the convener that has been the U.S. brand for decades. So Ambassador Shapiro, uh, how do you interpret or how would you think uh, does what Israel has agreed to with the UAE inform any of how it might approach, if you look at the polling, the prospect of a Democratic White House, Democratic-controlled Senate, Democratic-controlled Congress, um, how uh, they might take lessons learned from previous interactions with the last Democratic administration, uh, or how they will uh, factor in and try and address their concerns about Iran with new actors in Washington? Sure. Well, uh, it, it of course takes uh, some uh, other points of tension uh, out of the discussion, particularly uh, the discussion around annexation, and it creates an opening for a different kind of U.S. role, uh, trying to re-energize a regionally supported uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace process, uh, and that would be uh, of value, even though it's not directly related to Iran. It would show, uh, again, a uh, kind of a, a, an alignment of regimes and, and governments in the region uh, affiliated with the United States, all seeing Iran as a threat, all working together toward the end of another conflict that has festered for, for many decades. Um, and that would additionally help with the isolation uh, of Iran that, uh, that Dana referred to. Uh, now, look, uh, none of these governments that are immediately being, we're immediately talking about Israel or several of the Gulf states uh, were necessarily huge fans of the joint, uh, of the JCPOA. Uh, and they had their criticisms, obviously, Prime Minister Netanyahu was open about his, uh, in his speech in Congress, uh, Gulf states were a little more 
uh, subdued in how they spoke about it, but they certainly shared some of those criticisms. And, and definitely the alignment of interest that they feel between Israel and the Gulf states about the Iranian threat is a major reason uh, that this normalization deal has, has come about. Uh, again, I don't speak for the Biden campaign, but I think what they have, they have said clearly is that they have always viewed the JCPOA as it was, uh, and any attempt to return to that uh, form of, of diplomacy, whether it's as a pathway through a uh, JCPOA in which both sides have come back into compliance, which is very questionable whether Iran will be able to get back into compliance, or whether to look past the JCPOA, that was only really the beginning of the diplomacy toward Iran on its nuclear quest, on its nuclear and other uh, threats that it poses. And that it was always the expectation uh, of the Obama and Biden administration, and it would be of a Biden Harris administration, that uh, there needs to be additional diplomacy, it needs to be multilateral, it needs to be with in, co in coordination with allies who at the moment are not uh, working together with us. It will have forms of pressure associated with it, including sanctions, and we have to acknowledge the success, uh, at least on terms of the economy, uh, economic pressure that had been lodged against Iran during this period of, uh, of, of sanctions. Uh, in order to uh, get a, a longer and a stronger and a broader uh, nuclear deal that will uh, build on what the JCPOA achieved, which was a 10 to 15 year, year, year deal, keeping Iran at least a year from a nuclear weapon, which of course they're now less than, as Dana said, because they, they're not in compliance, but build something that will have uh, longer timelines, that will have even tougher inspection protocols, that will keep raw materials and other, uh, uh, other technologies out of Iran's hands, that will uh, apply to the ballistic missile program and use all of that in, in, the, hopeful, uh, in the hopes of, of, of an even broader regional uh, approach that will help uh, isolate and restrain Iran on the other non-nuclear uh, uh, dangerous activities it's involved in, the sponsorship of terrorist organizations, the uh, in, in, uh, involvement of, uh, uh, in the civil wars uh, and politics of its neighbors. So uh, there is an opportunity here. It doesn't mean that everybody will agree exactly on the approach, uh, but we don't need to say because there was disagreement about certain aspects of the JCPOA in 2015, there is not an alignment of interest. I think there very much is between the US, between our regional partners, Israel, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and others, uh, and our European partners and others to uh, build on what the JCPOA achieved, get that longer, broader, stronger agreement, uh, and hit tackle the other threats Iran poses. And Samira, again on the Hill, uh, we know there's frustration that this administration, uh, currently in the White House, has gone it alone, uh, not only not working with our allies internationally, but not working with our allies uh, down the road. Uh, what kind of receptivity do you think that a Biden administration will find in 2021 uh, for Democrats on the Hill to re-engage and to partner with the new administration uh, on these issues? Thanks for the question. And um, I am a, a watcher of Democrats on the Hill, although today I'm not speaking for any particular Democrat on the Hill. Um, I think that uh, Democrats, I, I, I noticed that, um, Democrats noticed that Iran is more dangerous today than it was when Trump was, uh, was inaugurated, that Iran is closer to getting a nuclear weapon today. Um, it is spinning more centrifuges. Its enrichment capacity is way higher. Um, Dan mentioned the timeline. Um, we are closer than we have been in a long time to an Iranian nuclear weapon, and that is under Trump's watch. And Democrats on the Hill will celebrate the day when they get to have a president that is going to keep America safer um, and our allies safer. And um, uh, to me personally, that uh, that person is unquestionably Joe Biden. Um, we also need a Congress that can be counted on to fully fund our diplomatic priorities so that uh, President Biden can restore U.S. leadership in the world. Um, for Democrats on the Hill, there is no hope for the Trump administration. Um, the, the Trump administration can talk a big game, but they can't get anyone on board with them. Um, and I think that that was, um, as Dana said, we saw that in, in, uh, in, in the vote last week. Um, their go it alone strategy hasn't worked and, um, and it, uh, it hasn't made us any safer. Great, thank you. All right, we're gonna start uh, with the questions, the multitude of questions that have been submitted in, but please uh, uh, keep them coming uh, for now. Uh, let me just, uh, someone wants to know, someone noted uh, the variety of experience that we have sitting here on this panel, uh, both sides of uh, the Hill, as well as uh, the executive branch uh, and other agencies. Um, let me, uh, I guess, Ambassador, start with you and your experience. 
Uh, in democratic administrations, uh, how much does uh, the perspective on the U.S.-Israel relationship uh, differ depending on which branch you're, you're sitting in, uh, in a, yeah, potentially in January? Uh, which, which department of the government or between the Hill and the executive branch? Uh, either, however you'd like to interpret yeah. that question. Okay. Uh, look, I, I would say that uh, what uh, the victory of Joe Biden in the primaries uh, means and what was really evident in the platform process, which I participated in as a member of the platform committee on behalf of the DNC, uh, was an articulation of what our very, very broadly held near consensus positions within the party. Uh, you can't say everybody, obviously. It's a big tent party and there are a range of views that will always be heard. But if you look at what uh, the positions that Vice President Biden and I would add uh, Senator Harris have, have laid out, uh, if you look at what's in the Democratic Party platform, if you look at two resolutions uh, that passed the House of Representatives in the last year, which obviously Mira worked very hard on along with many colleagues, uh, they uh, that, that received a broad, very close to unanimous, not a, maybe unanimous support uh, from, uh, from Democrats in the House. Uh, and you look at similar expressions from a wide range of senators and the uh, large numbers of uh, Democrats in both houses, as well as the vice president who spoke on the issue of annexation. What you find is that you have uh, really the broad consensus. That is uh, an absolute commitment to Israel's security, an absolute commitment to Israel's legitimacy, an expectation that the United States will be a leader in ensuring both of those, obviously by fulfilling uh, the commitment of the uh, MOU of $38 billion that was signed during the Obama-Biden administration and ensuring Israel's qualitative military edge against any threats it faces, and being a partner, being a real uh, integrated security partner in intelligence and technology and military training and all the other ways we work with Israel in standing up uh, to any challenge Israel's legitimacy, whether it's at the United Nations, whether it's uh, in other international institutions, whether it's in the BDS movement at home, uh, in uh, being also a very strong advocate for a two-state solution uh, that will end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Indeed, that's the only end that I would say the broad consensus in the party can see for the conflict that will keep Israel the Jewish and democratic state. It has always been and, and wants to be and is the values-based partner uh, of the United States that will ensure Israel's security, that will ensure Palestinians' legitimate rights to self-determination self and dignity in a state of their own can also be realized. And that will work with those both of those parties and hold both parties to their own obligations, not to do the unilateral measures that can make that more difficult, not to obviously uh, do annexation or, or delegitimization or any form of violence and terror, and uh, take the positive steps that are necessary. And now to draw other regional partners uh, into that effort. Uh, all of those uh, actors in the party see uh, significant uh, errors that the Trump administration has made in essentially uh, cutting off uh, diplomatic contact with the Palestinians. You can't really be the mediator in a conflict if you can't talk to one side of the conflict closing a consulate that dealt with the Palestinian Authority, uh, cutting off all streams of assistance, uh, including economic and humanitarian assistance, and assistance that, that supports uh, critical uh, security cooperation between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. These are things Israelis have wanted. These are things that US law permits, uh, even with the Taylor Force Act, which is also broadly supported, including by the Vice President. Uh, but these are all things that uh, the Trump administration has kind of dismissed because it doesn't really see itself as trying to negotiate uh, a, a two-state solution to end this conflict. The Trump plan is not that. Uh, it's something else. So uh, I see a very, very broad consensus. Uh, I see Vice President Biden and Senator Harris really uh, standing in that ground where they will have uh, an enormous amount of support within the party. And frankly, that is the traditional bipartisan consensus uh, uh, on the U.S.-Israel relationship. That's something else that uh, the vice president is uh, going to do that is going to be quite different from the Trump administration. Trump, uh, president Trump, unfortunately, has chosen to treat uh, Israel, and he is a supporter of Israel, I don't suggest otherwise, but he has chosen to tr uh, treat that as a uh, wedge issue, as a partisan uh, political football for his own his own interests and his own needs, uh, and in very uh, har uh, very crude ways, calling Democrats anti-Israel and anti-Semitic and disloyal, 
uh, if, uh, if they don't support him. Those are uh, not the ways that uh, every administration from both parties and both parties in Congress uh, through many decades have treated the Israel, U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, and that's what I think we'll see a Biden-Harris administration get back to. Dana, let me ask you this question from someone uh, who chimes in. Uh, to what degree is Saudi Arabia or uh, some of the other uh, Sunni states using the UAE agreement as a trial balloon uh, before making a decision about whether or not to go forward with uh, their own such agreement with Israel? That's a great question. I think that each country, it's both a trial balloon and we need to keep in mind um, the domestic situation of each country, the history of each country with Israel, uh, the extent to which relations have been under the table, over the table, et cetera. So yes, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, I think other countries are not gonna follow immediately. They're um, A, watching to see how the Washington establishment, the American people react to this. They are aware that there's general consensus by many on the right and the left of we need to get out of the Middle East. We need to end these forever wars in the Middle East. We're overly invested in the Middle East, specifically from a military perspective, but we need to counter Iran. We need to be in the Middle East to counter Iran and push back on Iran. So there's these trends, I think, broadly in the foreign policy debate to the extent that many American voters are voting based on foreign policy priorities that in some ways are irreconcilable. Um, at the same time, um, as, as the other speakers have mentioned, the UAE-Israel normalization announcement is easy to get behind from a bipartisan perspective. Um, improved ties, diplomatic relations, increased coordination across the economic spheres, the political spheres, cultural spheres, and the security sphere are in the U.S. interests. Um, so, so each country, though, has its own domestic priorities. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, uh, King, King Salman um, has very much identified with the Palestinian cause and in previous times in the past year has, has not specifically endorsed the Trump vision for a peace plan. Uh, there were er rumors earlier uh, in, in the Trump administration that, that Jared Kushner and Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, had worked on a plan whereby Saudi Arabia would champion a two-state, or Saudi Arabia would champion a situation in which there would be more pressure on the Palestinians. And then the, the understanding is that King Salman said, no, we stand by the Palestinians, we stand by the Arab Peace, peace Initiative, whereby we are putting on the table normalization for Israel with all Arab states in exchange for a state for the Palestinian people. And what this normalization announcement from last week does is say, no, we're, we're going to normalize now without an actual two-state outcome. But what we're doing is preventing unilateral annexation, which we saw, we the Arab states, as catastrophic for an eventual two-state outcome. So the UAE leadership sees what it's doing as preserving the possibility for a two-state solution when the two sides are ready to negotiate. Um, and different domestic audiences in different states in the, in the Middle East and, and specifically in Saudi Arabia have different views on that. So if you look at which countries came out in support of the normalization announcement between the UAE and Israel, it's Bahrain and it's Oman. Saudi Arabia has been silent officially, Kuwait has been silent officially, and Qatar has been silent officially. But we know that there are some under the table relationships ties by Saudi Arabia and the same with Qatar. And so this is about each government balancing its own domestic priorities, stability within these countries, also waiting to see again, as we discussed earlier, um, what the economic benefits, what the scientific benefits are between Israel and the UAE, and also whether or not that changes the standing of the UAE in Washington, which in some ways has been damaged in recent years um, and certainly in terms of a bipartisan consensus that the UAE is a strong security partner of the US, that is very much being questioned right now in Congress. And so again, this is not just about what the executive branch supports, it's about how we can take the promise of this normalization and whether or not it can be moved into something that can expand bipartisan support, um, whether it can get congressional support for improved arms sales, ways in which the United States can facilitate increased ties between the U.S. and Abu Dhabi, et cetera. So to get back to the original question, I think it is in some ways a trial balloon, 
but we also need to be very cognizant of the domestic constraints in many of these countries that may mean that while they're happy to continue deepening those ties under the table, some publics may not be ready just yet for over the table, on top of the table. Uh, Mira, another uh, actor in the region's reaction that we've seen has been uh, that of Mahmoud Abbas uh, and the PA, who've been uh, very critical of the UAE. Um, we also have to be cognizant Mahmoud Abbas is 84 years old. There's lots of questions about what succession like, might look like. Uh, how might this agreement with the UAE move that next generation of Palestinian leadership either for or against uh, normalization or uh, peace with Israel? Um, and are there other uh, factors going on within the Palestinian leadership that we should be paying attention to? So I think polls, um, polls generally show that there is still support for two-state solution among Palestinians. Um, I think what has been missing from, um, the, from previous negotiations has been popular demand. And I think it's really up to um, the United States, to our allies, um, to make sure that there's popular demand in both places um, for, um, for, a, for the kind of two-state solution agreement. Um, Congress is working right now on that as we speak with the Middle East Partnership for Peace Act, um, which is um, sponsored by Nita Lowy and Jeff Fortenberry. It is a bipartisan bill that would um, provide money to those groups who seek to build dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians and spur economic development um, among Palestinians. Um, these steps can absolutely pave the way for acceptance of one another. So um, if that was the thing, if that was the missing ingredient, um, then perhaps giving popular demand into these kind of negotiations, sometimes you have to build that in order to validate those who are doing those, that, that kind of work every day. Thank you, Mira. Uh, someone uh, wants to know, uh, just as we acknowledged a week ago, we didn't know we'd be spending so much time talking about the UAE agreement. Uh, in January of 2021, uh, is there anything that you can predict? Uh, and no one's traveling, so we're not going to take this to Vegas. But is there anything that you can predict uh, we might be talking about uh, when a new administration, a new Congress is sworn in uh, that we're not thinking about today? Uh, and uh, Ambassador, let me let me start with you. We'll go around the horn. Well, I'll say a couple of things. One is that uh, you know one of the uh, areas that's already been highlighted for cooperation between Israel and the UAE is uh, health care, health cooperation, particularly health technology cooperation, and uh, kind of a rapid response to COVID, uh, pooling knowledge and uh, research uh, uh, on vaccine and other treatment uh, opportunities. Uh, I hope by January we're a lot closer to solving this uh, pandemic problem for all of us in the United States where it's been terribly mismanaged, but globally where there's going to need to be a, 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 a kind of global uh, and a largely cooperative solution uh, once there's a vaccine and how it can be deployed and, and so forth. So it may be that even out of this partnership we'll see some uh, important developments that will help facilitate that. But I will say uh, more broadly, what uh, I'm looking forward to in January of 2021 uh, with a different administration is a United States back in a leadership role. A uh, United States that is respected, the United States that rejoins the Paris Climate Accords, United States that stops beating up on our allies uh, in NATO uh, and stops distancing ourselves uh, from uh, partners who are really our closest friends and cozying up to uh, the Vladimir Putins and Kim Jong-uns of the world. Uh, when the United States is in the lead on the big global challenges, whether they be pandemics, whether as we saw during the Ebola crisis of 2014, whether it be migration, whether it be climate, uh, whether it be uh, energy uh, challenges, uh, that's when we can solve problems. And we just haven't seen anything like that uh, for the last four years. Uh, that's exactly the uh, kind of leadership that uh, Joe Biden's going to bring. Uh, and it'll be very, very different and very, very refreshing. Uh, and uh, it will bring some positive surprises, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. Dana? I want to add to what uh, Dan said, which is not only um, what, not only has the Trump administration not led, but but the Trump administration has deliberately withdrawn the United States, in addition to the, climate, the Paris Climate Agreement, from, from frameworks and international organizations in which we could lead over and over and over. And a great example is withdrawing from the World Health Organization at the specific point in time where not only in the interest of the American people, but in the interest of the United States as a leader caring about other citizens, other peoples, other countries, 
that is the network through which we would want to share information, gain information, et cetera. Um, and, and this America alone, America first, means that we could be in, in contests for vaccinations or things that not only implicate Americans, but implicate Israelis and implicate others in the Middle East for a more unstable, um, less secure world. Um, and, and a more stable region and a more stable um, Middle East or world is in the interest of Israel and is, the, is in the interest of the US-Israeli partnership. So I think some of the things that we're gonna be discussing in January, 2021, are not just restoring U.S. leadership by um, entering some, some of the frameworks from which the Trump administration withdraw, withdrew, we're going to have to be thinking much more creatively and much more strategically about what the world needs in a post-COVID-19, post-oil price collapse, and global economic recovery. These are huge things. And, and, and then I would also add on top of that, that we, the United States, will be focused internally on our own recovery, as will every country in the Middle East, every country in Europe, et cetera, which means there will be less assistance dollars for assistance needing countries. There could be less contributions to international financial institutions with which the United States has historically and traditionally partnered to help um, more vulnerable, less economically resilient countries, et cetera, particularly in the Middle East. So if you look at all of Israel's neighbors right now, for example, all of them are at a, at a peak of instability as they attempt to respond to COVID-19 and the global recession and security challenges, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, et cetera. So we're going to have to be thinking and debating, and this will require both the Biden administration and Congress having frank discussions about what the United States role can be if there's less assistance dollars from us less assistance dollars at international organizations, um, and more, again, of a desire for citizens to turn inward and not, and not externally. And I think this has real implications for the Middle East. It has very real implications for Israel. And what it's going to take is an administration, the Biden administration, to stand up and not only advocate for US leadership in the region and on behalf of Israel, but to actually work hand in hand across the aisle in Congress, which is something that you haven't seen from the Trump administration. Bills only pass Congress when there's bipartisan consensus, which actually requires leadership and planning and execution. And Mira, final question to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I join my colleagues in their hope for U.S. leadership. I would also note that um, October is when the Iran arms embargo um, expires, and by January we may see the uh, we may see the consequences. Um, we may see new arms deals um, between Iran and others, um, both to and from Iran. And um, and I think that um, that will be um, that will loom large on the uh, on the. Um, on the plate of the of the new Biden administration, um, trying to figure out how to um, how to get Iran to be in compliance with with the nuclear deal, and how to make sure that Iran is not um, is not buying and selling weapons all over the globe, which um, has has real consequences for Israel and for other allies around the world. Thank you, Mira, and thank you uh, to all of our incredible panelists for being here for this conversation today. We're uh, truly fortunate to have friends and allies like you in the fight. Uh, for a strong pro-Israel Democratic Party. Uh, we hope you all remain uh, safe and healthy. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to another one of our board uh, members from Chicago, Illinois, uh, Mark Gerstein, uh, to close us out. Thanks, Elliot. And let me reiterate our deep appreciation to the Ambassador Dana and Mira for that tremendous discussion. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us with your questions and participation. As you, uh, as you heard from Mark Melman at the top of the call, DMFI is the only organization of fighting to ensure the Democratic Party remains strongly pro-Israel. Uh, as a founding member of the board of DMFI, I've had the opportunity to watch it play this unique role with incredible efficacy and efficiency uh, throughout the political cycle, uh, during the presidential primaries, uh, during state platform debates, key Democratic pr congressional primaries, and most recently in the thick of the drafting debate and negotiation uh, for the Democratic Party's platform on issues concerning the Middle East. Um, throughout this cycle and these processes, we've faced challenges from those who at turns have sought uh, to, to weaken the Israeli relationship with the United States and the longstanding Democratic Party support for Israel. Um, if you also are committed to overcoming 
uh, those challenges and achieving those goals, we ask you to join our work. Um, while you're already in front of a screen, uh, please go to dmfi.org to sign up for more information, to receive invitations to our programs throughout the year, and to make a donation. Uh, you can also reach out to Elliot, uh, uh, to Mark Melman, and other board members through our website, or send us a note at info at dmfi.org. Thank you again. We hope to see you uh, on our DNC programs, DNC programs tomorrow and throughout the rest of the week.